Hello and welcome to the Science for Societal Progress podcast. This is the first Q&A episode where we are having a conversation about whatever is news in academia or the interactions of science and society. My co-host is Dr. Bart Gerton. You may remember him from episode 8 when we talked about cognitive biases in science and society. In this episode, we want to talk about meritocracy in academia based on what we learned in the episode 9 with Björn Brems, where we talked about journal impact factor and its impact on academia. Before we jump in, let me make a brief announcement. We always welcome your feedback. If you have questions, critique or suggestions, you can send us an email to info at scienceforprogress.eu Message us on social media at sci for progress on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or leave us a video message on Skype for the account Dennis.Eckmeyer. That's my name, Dennis.Eckmeyer. A more direct way of getting into contact is our monthly member meeting on Discord, a voice and text chat service. To be invited to these meetings, all you need to do is to support us with $3 per month or €2.53 on Patreon, www.patreon.com slash progress In fact, if you like our work and want to help us sustain or even grow and improve Science for Progress, Patreon is the best way to do it. It's a service for membership-supported organizations, and just as in any society, club or association, you can choose your level of engagement yourself. But on Patreon, you can also choose your membership fees yourself. If you pledge exceed a threshold, you enter a membership tier and you get some perks. I already mentioned that if you pledge more than $3, you will be invited to our monthly member meetings. But if you pledge $6 or 5 euros and 6 cents or something, you will get access to a director's cut version of this podcast which will be longer than the final version and released a few days earlier. And if you pledge even more, I will put your name on our website or even mention you on the podcast to thank you for your generosity. And the first person I have the honor to mention is Bard. Thank you, Bard. Are you gone? <laughs> yeah, I'm hiding under my desk. This sounds like I bought me into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> No, he did not buy himself into the podcast, uh, but he was very generous. It's like you. It's like you said. All friends knock on your door and ask, "Would you like to be a patron of my podcast?" And then you are basically bound to do something. <laughs> I just realized that uh, the semester just began, so we met pretty much exactly sixteen years ago. That's true. You came to Cologne to study there, which I can totally understand because it's the best city in the world. We finished college together and we more or less at the same time. And then we both met again in Bielefeld doing our PhDs. You actually told me about the, the opening. So that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it goes to show that all positions in academia are given just by merit. <laughs> Not by knowing a guy that knows a guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, we're going straight there, right? <laughs> so getting started in the semester, you're preparing a lot of lessons and lectures? Yeah, so our semester starts like all our semesters in October. And I start preparing courses for the developmental and neuronal behavioral master courses, which is includes learning experiments and experiments with optomotoric setups with insects. I also prepare a course for our Max Planck Research School, research school. and there actually it's two different experiments and two lectures we have to give. So it's going to be a long, hard winter yeah. till Christmas. Winter is coming, Bart. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's students. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty enjoyable. I I like to teach, so I don't mind that. But I, I'm really, really surprised how much work goes into that. And I'm sorry to all my lecturers. 
I never gave them enough credit for doing the awesome work that they did. They will be happy to hear it, which of course they do. Everybody listens to this podcast. I hope so. Okay. You want to get to the point? To meritocracy? I was pretty surprised by this word. How meritocracy. What does it actually mean in academia? Meritocracy means that merit rules. Basically, the idea is that everything that counts for you to move up, to reach higher ranks, and to get good positions and funding, etc., 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 is based on your scientific ability and the type of questions you ask, maybe even that. And in episode 9, I talked to Björn Brems, who is a colleague of yours who is also doing Drosophila Neuroscience. We were talking about the so-called journal impact factor and how it is calculated. And it appears it's not calculated the way you'd think it would be calculated. Basically, what you assume is that you have a, a normal distribution of citations. So if you uh, take every paper and count the ones that have one citations and one that have two citations, etc., 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 then you would get a bell-shaped distribution. And the journal impact factor is supposed to be the peak of this bell-shaped curve that you calculate by just dividing all the citations by the total number of papers that go into the that get these citations and you do that for each journal to calculate the impact i'm doing air quotes here that nobody will see of a journal and that is already problematic because the real distribution is not bell-shaped, it's skewed to the left, which means if you calculate the mean like that, you don't actually get the peak of the curve, which would be the representative number, but you get something higher. So uh, you have a number that is already probably not representative of the impact of the journal, but also they can fudge the number by negotiating. So the journals can go negotiate with the company that's calculating the journal impact factor and say, oh, I don't want these certain types of papers go in there or articles go in there. But the total number of citations stays the same. So they can change basically the number by which the whole thing is divided. And so they can by by put by making this number smaller, you get a larger journal impact factor. But what I found even more surprising when you were talking with Björn was that they seemingly tried to reconstruct what the journals did to derive at that number, mm -hmm. and the numbers wouldn't add up. I was pretty much shocked to my core because I thought that the journal impact factor, which a lot of my decisions in publication are based on, that I look at the journal and say, they have an impact factor of 3 or 13 or whatever number, decides often if I try or not try to publish my uh, scientific results there. And I did an interview series with all my colleagues in the Schwanschleiden Center. Seriously? And asked them, yeah, I asked them, what do you think the journal impact factor is based on? All of those said, it's the number of citations per article. And that's what I would have answered too. And then I told them about this and they were all very shocked because you you think that this is the one metric that decides over so much in, in a scientific career. And if you have just another low impact factor publication, nobody gives a damn. But if it's a nature, a neuron science publication, like the whole department is joining in to celebrate that. Yeah, exactly. And it's so weird. <laughs> 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 because also these high impact factor journals have the highest uh, retraction rates too, <laughs> which uh, everybody seems to ignore in that context. They have the highest re retraction rates? Yeah, yeah, they do. That's also something that uh, Bjorn indirectly talked about. He was saying that there are certain fields where the science becomes less uh, rigorous with higher impact factors. So basically his finding was that either the impact factor has no meaning or it means that the study is worse 
So yeah, an an in very interesting uh discussion. I I thought so too. Um I was not completely surprised because I heard of all of these things on science Twitter. If you want an ear on these kind of things, then um you can follow me on Twitter and then follow everybody I follow and then you hear things. Um because science Twitter is one of the places I see these kind of things discussed. Uh I think one of the problems here is that Actually, the influential people are not aware of that fact. And I think we have to publicize this even more. Science Twitter is a very nice place to actually to discuss those things, but it's used more often by early career researchers at the moment than by senior career researchers. And the senior labs are often on Twitter via like their public relations guy or their one student who knows how to use Twitter we should write that down, for example, for the DZG news. I think you're absolutely right. So there was a lot of discussion, actually, after the episode. And in one of these discussions, Bjorn said that he had tried to publish this a few years ago. And the reviewers said, oh, no, we already know how the journal impact factor is made. And this is not new. And we are not going to publish that. Yeah, but the major science news channel, which is our scientific journals, seemingly actually hides that information from us. We have to discuss if this is the way how we want our journals to be ranked. If we at all want to rank our articles in this way, my old supervisor always was very annoyed by me being concentrated on bibliography. Like, how good can we place our articles? And one of the discussions we often had is that I said, but your generation created this system. You made Nature a better journal than, or a more impactful journal than Journal of Comparative Physiology A. True. And I'm totally, uh, totally happy to publish there, but this has a journal impact factor of less than one. Right. What am, what am I supposed to do if I want to have a postdoc? Yeah, And I think as a new generation of scientists, we should ask ourselves if this is really the way we want to judge our scientific merit anymore. Right, absolutely. So the journal impact factor measures the one thing that is the reputation of the journal, which is completely arbitrary. And that's more like a, like a feeling <laughs> and less of obviously a metric so it correlates well with that but so the, the problem with that i also have is that this metric isn't really meant to judge the quality of papers it's meant to judge the quality of the journal and the difference is that if you have a distribution and let's say it would be even the right distribution that is appropriate for this kind of a calculation, mean calculation, it would be bell, bell shaped. Then if you just take one article and say, Oh, it appeared in this journal, the probability is pretty high that it's much better or much worse than what the mean would be. And then you do that for every paper that one author has written. And then you say, Oh, the researcher has a cumulative a journal impact factor of so-and-so, and each of these measures is, is unreliable. So you would need uh, one person to have published a lot of papers so that the um, the error cancel each other out. So, But most, most especially early career researchers don't have that many papers. And then you never know how many, how, how the contribution was. Yeah. I think one of the problems, though, is that we need some system to judge our scientific merit. And if we would do that based on the articles that we wrote for scientific magazines, we could also rely on the citations that each article would collect over time. Uh, we call that the Hirsch Index or the H Index, which is how many papers we have with a certain number of citations. In the H Index, if you have, for example, seven as an H index, you have seven papers with at least seven citations. But now, even if I look just on my citations, the number of 
citations per paper is vastly different if it's, for example, a method methodological paper or if it's a genuine new result. For example, the one that I still have that has the most citations is one that uh, some sort of Dennis Eckmeyer guy <laughs> first authored about <laughs> the gay strategy of finches. The gay strategy uh, of finches? <laughs> it's about gaze, the gaze. gazing, like where, where the bird is looking <laughs> while it's flying. About well, the gay strategy of finches. And what I found extremely funny about that one is that we actually published it in PLOS One, yeah. which is often thought as the plan B of publishing very often. It didn't suffice for any other paper. I put it to PLOS One. It's quite often a sentence I heard in my career. But the one paper, the one article I ever published, like both articles I published in PLOS One, carried over 50 citations. And our just newly written urine new paper has exactly zero at the moment. Right. But if you would compare journal impact factors, our new paper would be much better. Yes, exactly. So that's kind of tricky, right? Yeah, so it's I heard very weird because because nobody would say, I want to go plus one because I think this is the journal where my research belongs because I wanted to reach as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. But everybody would say, I'd like to have a nature paper or a science paper. Yeah. But in reality, this reaches less people because... If you are not at a university or have no affiliation to one, it's really hard to get these articles, whereas PLOS One is just a download away. Right. So this this is the open access thing. The traditional high journal impact factor journals are all closed access. So the public has no access and universities that don't have a lot of money may not necessarily have access or no easy access uh, that plays a role there was a study somewhere showing that on average open access gathers more citations so if you want a high age index go open access but instead of discussing all the problems that we face already and that Pion already and you beautifully took apart mm -hmm. we should Think about one aspect that was pretty short in the podcast, but which I found very interesting. This is finding new metrics for the merit of science. Right. One is, is this novelty thing. And I think novel new scientific results are very often the reason why we think nature is more important than any other journal, because we think that the most important, most novel results will be published there. Right. But what I found brilliant from Bjorn was that he actually said, what about coding? Isn't that a very important merit in modern science? And if you if you look at programs like DeepLabCut or uh, ID Tracker by all those different labs, they will change the way we do science because they allow us to do efficiently video analysis and of course we can publish the article that is going along with the software in a high impact journal but we can also directly merit the coding ability right and just to explain really quickly bart and i both come from a field where you do behavioral studies and the animals often move really quickly and it's really hard to quantify the movements. So you need systems that are very good at getting a lot of information in high-speed recordings. So it's usually from several angles. And then on top of that, you need to track the position of limbs, for example, or the whole animal. When the two of us were PhD students, uh, that was still done uh, by hand. So we clicked on in the video to um, to mark the positions and this can now be done with algorithms and computer vision which is really moving the field forward and the very latest methods that Bart just mentioned actually even use machine learning to find the different moving parts and mark them and every system you get for this that I know of and that works very well is developed through public money in research institutes. Yeah, I think we should talk about things like novelty of the science, 
availability of the science and outreach. Like how, how many people are actually impacted by the science. Right. What we see in the States at the moment is that scientific programs get cancelled because nobody knows about the benefit that the society actually has from science. Like, for example, weather predictions, which are very important and which became much better over the years. When I was still a child, that was basically gambling. And nowadays, it's a very exact science with like huge mathematical models. Right. And I think, like, at least for me, those three things, like novelty, availability, can I use that? And the societal outreach uh, would make a perfect try to judge the merit of a scientist because it's it's a combination of these three things that create impact to the society. I, I think you're absolutely right. But this is a very hard problem, I think, to find really good quantitative, non-biased measures by which to judge a researcher. So I actually, I actually like very much the idea of just going through the applicant's ideas and then at some point say, okay, now we throw the dice and these are the people that we, we are going to fund. What do you think about that? Can't be worse for me than writing applications. <laughs> But you would still have to write an application, right? But they need to know what you're going to do and to judge if it's a valid hypothesis and things like that. And if, if your methods of testing the hypothesis is, is good. But I think it can cannot only be a raw of dice. You have to weight it somehow. And maybe you weight it also with the applicant's ability to pull off the project. But how do you measure it's that? It's kind of complicated. I don't say that's easy to do. And also, it will like benefit those people who had a lot of funding money, who have shown that they can finish a project, but it keeps you from not finishing projects. Maybe you don't care about how many projects you already finished, but you take as a negative weight if somebody applied for money and then didn't do the science or the science or the project seemed to be fraudulent or whatever, so that you at least can have some penalties and don't throw money into the same person over and over again. That never finished a project or never had a project or had never had in mind to do a project. Ah. What I really like to know is like how they go about finding out which projects to fund. Grants from colleagues, which I would have totally funded, got stellar reviews and one but. Something like, mm -hmm. oh, this grant is nice, the idea is uh, well thought through, the person published a lot, but unluckily, a lot of times with his PhD supervisor, and it got rejected. Right, yeah, yeah. And it's always like really minor details. And seemingly, if you want to get through with your grant, everything has to be stellar. Everything has to be yeah. awesome. And there are things that you can't, uh, can't change anymore, right? Once you publish a lot with your PhD advisor, you cannot undo that. And I personally don't think that's a bad thing that you are able to keep up a relationship with your PhD advisor and work together. That doesn't mean that you're not able to have your own ideas. I would agree on that, yeah. But it's also other things. If you couldn't show enough scientific autonomy, that's one part where grants get killed for. Another one is quite often that one of the uh, reviewers disagrees on a scientific issue. There's at least one disagreement with every scientist. If there wouldn't be, that would be really weird. Like, <laughs> there's not there's not a single scientific topic that one of my students wouldn't at least dispute one of my positions on. Right. And it's part of the scientific idea to have this conversation. And I don't think that we should decline grants because somebody has a different or maybe better idea. This is just part of science. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what that also means is that we are not funding the risk-taking projects. The novelty in applications is actually low because what they want to see in those is that there's a high probability that the money is well spent. And that would mean you get publications. And in order to get publications, because we have this nice publication bias, you need positive results. 
So what they're going for is hypotheses that they think have a very high likelihood of being correct, which basically means that they're not funding high-risk novel approaches. They just want the small next step that is pretty obvious based on what you already know. On the other hand, there's always the argument that just because it's high risk, it's not per se good. Oh, interesting science. Yeah, but um, still, I mean, there should be a good balance of doing the small iterations, but also taking some risk and try to find new frontiers. One measure, which is one thing that we use now, is like how much funding you could attract. That's very often used as a measurement for how well you do as a scientist. Right. And this is even weirder. I could basically do all the science I did, which is not that much, but it's at least 18 publications without much funding, right. except of some scholarships. So actually, this now is a problem in my career, as I didn't attract big sums of money in the beginning, as I usually build my setups my own, and I need a few thousand euros to do something, which I usually flying around in a department, or I use old stuff that is already there. But being financially efficient is not helpful. Like, if I would count my impact factor against dollars spent, I get a really high number because I have next to no dollars spent. <laughs> if we do the old bang for your buck thing, I'm not too bad at that. But if you look at my CV and say, like, how much funding did the guy get? There's a low number there. Right. This is problematic yeah. to me. And this is problematic to... I just, on Science Today, I read of another woman who said... There was always enough funding. Why should I apply? I did all the teaching. I did all the science. Then I need, now I can't get a professorship or a permanent position because I didn't attract the funding. Yeah, because she didn't have to, right? Yeah, and if you don't have to, you don't yeah. because there's always something better to do. Yeah. That was actually something I was told. If in, you're an uh, early career researcher, comic start writing that grant now. Yeah, absolutely. Write all the grants and fellowships, all of them. Just do it. <laughs> Otherwise, you end up making podcasts with your old friend from college. Exactly, like me. <laughs> this hits really close to home right now, Bart. <laughs> <laughs> I also didn't get funding and uh, fellowships. I was applying for fellowships. And part of it was, of course, that I didn't get funding before. How do you support early career researchers if you give funding predominantly to people who already had funding. But also, like, the major other way how we measure merit in science next to funding and publications is awards and prizes that you get. Quite often, if I hear my superiors talk, they say, oh, we have to find a nominee for that prize. Now, if you're an re early research scientist, try to get an award. Most of the time, the award committees have really problems to find any nominee. And it's the weirdest criteria that they use to find a nominee for a research prize. That was very surprising to me. I always thought like they they would look through like any kind of weird almanac where they can find all the very important papers and then say, oh, this person for that paper that was really breathtaking, or oh, I'm going to give them an award. But in reality, it's basically like an application to any other grant. And what's also very funny is usually you pick one person out of one article to get an award. And um, I remember one of the first papers I read about algorithms was from a guy that used an algorithm by Yves Bouget to actually show that this was applicable to his problem, which is a very normal way to do science and computer science as far as I understand it. But he got this prize, a very special reward, and I was surprised because I thought like all the innovative work was done by Ifuji in this case. If you think about like a person got an award for a certain project, then whose who's merit is this actually? Is it the supervisor's merit for helping that person to actually come to a solution with this project? This is the first researcher's merit because he did the work on it? Right. Or is it basically like all sciences, just the combination of many other small steps by other people that led to the final result. 
Right. So since we're talking about prizes, Nobel Prize, especially in physics, seem to go more and more to people who are the leaders of huge groups. So the, the paper or the work that gets Nobel Prize would be in a publication with a hundred authors, for example. If you look at the publications that come out of CERN, there are a lot of authors. And the Nobel Prize is not given to a hundred people, it's given to one of them. What is ignored by the Nobel Committee there is, I think that many of the laureates then are more of science managers. If you're the head of such a big collaboration, your job is less on groundbreaking science, but more on keeping the collaboration together. And this is a huge project management problem. And I totally agree. They should be laureated for that. But as long as there's no Nobel Prize for project management, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. They, they did have a scientific impact on the work, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it might have been years before the project, but still. I just think there's a good point to be made for recognizing or giving the prize to a group of people rather than a single person. That would also reflect more what the nature of science is about to become or already is in, in uh, fundamental physics. If you work in many different labs, you find a lot of really brilliant scientists and you find only a few really good project managers or people that are really good at human resource management. And on top of that, we don't improve the situation for people that have those skills. If you have project management skills, nobody gives a damn because you're not going to make a PhD. You also have to have like this mathematical scientific skills. And this basically leads to lab heads that very often are really bad at managing people and really good at science, which they are not allowed to do anymore because they have to do project management, which is suck at, and therefore things get worse. When I was in the United States as a postdoc, we even had a seminar where we invited early career principal investigators. So they had become assistant professors somewhere, and they were like a year or two in, and all of them said, I don't know what I'm doing I don't feel I was prepared. There was actually a poll by Nature asking who had got leadership training as a postdoc before they went and became professors, or you could give early career professors leadership courses and things like that. And it wasn't that many. And there were even a lot of people who said they didn't even want that. But of the people who... Uh, who actually took leadership courses, 80% said that it was very helpful. In Germany, there's the Fraunhofer Institution, which is basically like an independent research organization that does applied sciences and does work with the industry all the time. And their research organization is completely different from the university research organization as the project manager of a research project is very often a research member in a different project and works on like two to three different projects in a metrics organization. A metrics means sometimes you're the project manager, sometimes you're the scientist, sometimes you're just a collaborator that gives in data or software and has like a supportive function. And universities are strictly linear systems. So there's like one guy on the top or one woman on the top that dictates down research. And of course, we're all teams, and of course, we all talk to each other, and you can talk to your PI, and he pretends to give a shit. <laughs> but in a metrics organization, you are sometimes basically the PI, and sometimes you're just a PhD student. This actually mm. helps you to shift your view all the time and abolishes perception gaps. Like I think in the Nature article you were talking about, they have this graphic where they talk about perception gaps, like, could your PI summarize your project, yes or no? And they ask the PIs, could you summarize the projects of all your students? And I remember it was about 65 or 75 percent of the uh, of the PI said, yes, I can totally do that. <laughs> and the student said, 
a student answered in the same way about like 30 to 40 percent of the time there was like a 30 percent gap between being non-pi being a pi about like the idea if the pi could visual summarize all the projects right and i think this perception gap changes if you're sometimes the pi and sometimes you're just the collaborator or or the researcher on the project as a natural scientist, we often lose sight of what the humanities and liberal arts already developed. And we could use that to make our situation better, but because we are so high and mighty as natural scientists, we just ignore that and work like people worked in the 1980s, uh, in the 1890s. Super wise man, what's the next episode going to be about? Well, postdoc boy, <laughs> for the next episode... <laughs> Uh, I had not one, but three guests, and I made a crossover with a recovering academic podcast where they talk about the difficulties that academics face who decided to leave academia and are now looking into finding a life outside the ivory tower. They say there is sunshine out there, Bart. I doubt it. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> if you like our podcast, don't forget to subscribe on the podcast app of your choice, give us that sweet 5-star rating and check out our Patreon community on www.patreon.com slash cypherprogress. And finally, if you speak German and are on Twitter, I will be curating the rotating curation account at realsci underscore de for a week, starting on Monday, October 29th. See you around. Bye-bye.